Hello everyone and welcome. In this video we are talking about the Koenigsegg Gamera and its incredible engine. This is the world's most powerful three-cylinder engine that is also road emissions compliant. Now the Gamera is a pretty complex vehicle so I want to start with a high-level overview of the powertrain. Hold on a second, did you just say Gamera like a Gamoron? Look, y'all gotta have something to talk about in the comments. At the back of the vehicle are two beefy electric motors. They're each rated for 500 horsepower and 1,000 newton meters of torque, and they each have a single speed gearbox before sending power to the rear wheels independently. Sandwiched between the motors is the Tiny Friendly Giant, or TFG, our lovely three-cylinder engine which is placed longitudinally. This potent engine is good for 600 horsepower and 600 newton meters of torque, and mounted to the end of its crankshaft is another electric motor, good for an additional 400 horsepower and 500 newton meters of torque. If you've been adding all of that up, you're at 2,000 horsepower, though the actual output is about 1,700 horsepower, as the battery has limits to how much power it can supply, and motors and engines make peak power at different times. Here's a plot of what those horsepower and torque curves look like. If you were to add up the three motors horsepower, you'd get 1,400 horsepower, but due to the battery limitations, peak combined will be 1,100 horsepower from the motors, and then 600 from the engine. The engine and third motor actually send power to the front wheels exclusively, so this is Koenigsegg's first all-wheel drive model. Power is sent through a carbon fiber torque tube, then passes through a torque converter, and then through a simple ring and pinion to split power between the front wheels. On each side of the ring and pinion are wet multi-plate clutches, so either front axle can be completely locked up or detached, allowing for torque vectoring. With independent rear motors, the rear also has torque vectoring, and each motor has a wet clutch to detach completely, meaning for highway cruising, it can operate as front wheel drive only for optimal efficiency. Powering all of the electric motors is a 16.6 kilowatt hour, 800 volt battery pack. The pack is good for 50 kilometers or about 31 miles of electric only range and can be charged using the engine through regenerative braking or by plugging the car in. Total combined range is 1,000 kilometers or about 620 miles. Now that's not nearly all of it, so we're going to get more into the overall layout later on in the video, but for now let's focus on this incredibly impressive three-cylinder engine. Now let's talk specs. This is a two-liter inline three-cylinder engine, so the engine isn't very big and there aren't many cylinders. However, with a bore of 95 millimeters and a stroke of 93.5 millimeters, the cylinders themselves are actually quite large. In fact, if you're to compare it to Koenigsegg's 5 liter V8, these cylinders are actually larger. And so how does this thing make so much power, 600 horsepower, 600 newton meters? Well, some engines will make a lot of power through revving very high. Some engines will make a lot of power through a lot of boost. This is doing both. So it has two bar 29 PSI of boost pressure and it revs to 8,500 RPM. So you can kind of think of it like a Honda S2000 engine, which was naturally aspirated, and tripling the amount of air that goes inside of that engine. So you can make 600 horsepower, 600 newton meters of torque. 300 horsepowers per liter, which Koenigsegg says is 2.5 times more than the next highest rated three-cylinder engine. This is the most powerful road-going 2-liter engine, and it only weighs 70 kilograms. Now, one of the other things I thought was pretty interesting when looking at these specifications is this has a stroke of 93.5 millimeters paired with a very high 8,500 RPM redline. And combined, this is a bit unusual because that means the pistons are moving extremely quickly. Now, we can calculate the average piston speed by taking 2, multiplying it by our stroke length, multiplying that by our RPM divided by 60. And so if you do that for this tiny friendly giant engine, what you get is 26.5 meters per second. Now that may not mean much to you, but if we compare it to the Honda S2000, which revved all the way to 9,000 RPM with a stroke of 84 millimeters, it has an average piston speed of 25.2. So this is faster moving pistons uh, than the Honda S2000 engine, that F20C, and versus an F1 engine, if you look at today's F1 engines, they're 1.6 liter V6s, they rev up to 15,000 RPM with a stroke of 53 millimeters. Multiply this out and we get an average piston speed of 26 
8.5 meters per second. So this thing has pistons that move as fast as F1 engines. It's got cylinders that are larger than Koenigsegg's V8 cylinders, and it has 29 PSI of boost. Now, another cool thing about this engine is that it uses Koenigsegg's free valve technology. Now, I already have a video explaining how free valve works if you'd like to check that out. So in this video, we're going to focus on what are the advantages of incorporating free valve onto this engine. Now, a traditional engine will use a camshaft to open and close the valves. And so as you can see, there's only going to be one point in time where this cam lobe right here is at its peak lift, meaning you have peak valve lift. Koenigsegg's free valve doesn't have any camshafts. Instead, each individual valve has an actuator, so you can open it completely all the way, let it sit there, and then return it. And it does that using pneumatic actuators. So if you look at a plot of time versus valve lift, looking at a traditional engine, you'll see the valve lift follows that profile of the camshaft. However, with Koenigsegg's free valve, you pop straight up to maximum lift, and then you come right back down. So that means you can have more airflow actually coming into the engine and make more power. You've got less restriction for that air to come in. And also, you can choose between all these different methods of how you wanna vary timing, lift, and duration. So with a traditional engine, you can of course vary that valve timing, so you're changing the exhaust valve and intake valve overlap. Same thing here with Koenigsegg's free valve. You can vary your valve lift. So there are plenty of engines. Some only choose between two profiles. Some have infinitely uh, variable engines like BMW or Nissan. But with BMW or Nissan, when they change the valve lift, they are not independently changing it. So they're also changing valve duration. Whereas with the Koenigsegg, you can keep that duration the same and just alter how much lift you have. And then finally, with variable valve duration, of course, Hyundai's engine is capable of independently varying valve duration. However, Koenigsegg's also can independently vary valve duration while simultaneously independently varying valve lift. So Hyundai's engine could not vary valve lift. So this is going to be the first engine in which you have fully variable valve timing, fully variable valve lift, and fully variable valve duration. And so you can choose any of these points at any given RPM, any given load, what you're going for, whether it's efficiency or whether it's power or whether it's emissions. You can optimize all three of these among other parameters and choose the best spot for whatever you're targeting. So you have an immense amount of flexibility with this engine. Some other advantages, you can choose between just using one or two valves to open up. So you could just have one intake valve open and create some swirl or some tumble within that cylinder. You could choose to have both for better airflow. You can implement cylinder deactivation really easily because all you do is you just don't open the valves. You don't need a throttle uh, with this engine you can use valve lift in order to throttle the engine for low loads or high loads and so that improves efficiency and again just having all of this control means that you can optimize for whatever you're looking for now there are of course some drawbacks to this system the obvious ones being cost and complexity this is an extremely expensive car so don't look at this and be like wow none of the other manufacturers know what they're doing because Koenigsegg can get 600 horsepower out of a 2 liter engine so could they, they would just charge a lot more for their cars. This you know, is a million plus dollar car. So uh, cost comes with these added cool features. Uh, and then from an energy standpoint, it actually does seem like a fairly energy intense system because it's electronic, it's hydraulic, and it's pneumatic. So you have an air compressor on board as well in order to power opening and closing these valves. A traditional spring will return the valve, but air pressure will set it down to its lift. Now, partially possible because of free valve, this is actually a twin turbocharged engine. And you might be wondering, wait a minute, it has three cylinders and two turbochargers? How do you split those cylinders between the two turbochargers? So let's look at the layout. And so here you can see the three cylinders and you have your individually split exhaust for each cylinder. So it has two exhaust valves and each exhaust valve routes to a different turbocharger. So for example, your air would come in through this compressor side of the turbocharger, travel through the air to water intercooler, enter the engine. At low RPM, we're only going to be going through this red exhaust right here. The free valve is going to keep this second exhaust valve closed. So all of your exhaust is just going out one exhaust valve and that's all being routed to just one turbocharger. 
Then as you start to increase RPM, you open up both exhaust valves and you spool up both turbochargers and you make peak power. So at low RPM, when it's just using this single turbocharger, by closing off that exhaust valve, it's able to spool up peak spool at 1700 RPM. And then as you increase in RPM and you have enough plenty of exhaust gases to spool up both, it switches over and you're able to produce 600 newton meters of torque from 2000 RPM all the way up to 7,000 RPM. Very cool strategy that they have here with the turbochargers and using free valve to split the exhaust gases. Now let's go back to our layout. And what's interesting about this is just like the Koenigsegg Regera, there are not multiple gears here. So all of our power sources are passing through just a single gear ratio. So our tiny friendly giant engine at the back coupled with that motor uh, in front of it is sending torque to the front, which has a gear ratio of 2.69 to one with that ring and pinion. And then in the rear, we have two electric motors. Each has its own individual gearbox with a 3.325 to one gear reduction. And so if we add up our wheel torque, uh, in the front we have 600 newton meters plus 500 newton meters, multiply that by 2.69, we get 2,960 newton meters. In the rear we have two electric motors, each with 1,000 newton meters of torque, multiply that by 3.325, and we get 6,650. So we combine, have 9,610 newton meters. Now Koenigsegg says the actual wheel torque peaks at 11,000 newton meters. So where does that come from? Well, through this hydraulic coupling. So Koenigsegg says with this hydraulic coupling, you can have up to two times torque multiplication, up to 3,000 RPM. And then it'll lock up and be more efficient once you reach higher speeds. So that's how they're able to increase their peak wheel torque up to 11,000 newton meters. Now, one of the things you may have noticed is that these gear ratios are fairly low. So why would they choose a fairly low gear ratio? Well, if you're to compare it to a traditional vehicle, these may be about a third or a fourth. However, this is allowing for still crazy high wheel torque and yet a very high top speed. So this vehicle has a top speed of 400 kilometers per hour or 250 miles per hour. I was curious, so I did the math on multiplying out uh, based on the wheel size and the gear ratios, what the front and rear would actually achieve. And it's something like 260 miles per hour if you assume no tire deformation. And of course, with a little bit of tire deflection, that's gonna come down to its top speed of about 200 50 miles per hour. So it is geared so that it has an insane acceleration to 60 miles per hour or 100 kilometers per hour. Koenig said, says it's good for 1.9 seconds, zero to 100 kilometers per hour, which if you actually believe means its average acceleration is 1.49 Gs, something we have not yet seen in a production car. So it'll be interesting to see what it actually achieves. And this is good for all the way up to 250 miles per hour, where it's basically gear limited to that speed. So it's got insane acceleration uh, that entire way uh, and has that crazy high top speed. So quite a cool vehicle, quite a cool engine that has gone into it. Of course, all at a very expensive price, but a very neat thing nonetheless. So thank you all so much for watching. And if you have any questions or comments, of course, feel free to leave them below.